What I'd like to talk to you guys about today is kind of a part two spin off of the most recent episode that Todd just put out titled, How to Create the Perfect Kill Plot. If you guys haven't checked out that episode, I don't know if the editors can throw a, something in the corner of the screen or maybe a link in the description down below. Regardless, check that episode out. Todd goes through and identifies a spot that was invaded by bush honeysuckle and he removes it, turns it into a beautiful little kill plot tucked in between two known bedding areas. So what I'd like to talk to you guys about today, however, is a similar topic um, but slightly different in a sense instead of creating a food plot bottleneck between two bedding areas what I've been working on here for the past couple years is a sweet little native restoration area that was once getting encroached by cedar trees that is tucked between a known bedding area and a known food source so before I get into too many details on the habitat side of things let's go back and check out a hunt that I had here on October 22nd of last fall really really cool spot there's a perfect hourglass shape restoration area that we started doing here a couple years back. We've been running prescribed fire and you can see over my shoulder right here a bunch of native grass starting to come back in. Bunch of rubs and scrapes down this whole line and if they pinch through right there that's 18 yards. Well, that was a really sweet hunt. I hope you guys enjoyed that little recap. I know it was one of the highlights of my hunting season. I was that close, that close to getting a buck and a doe down within minutes of each other, but can't complain too much. He's gonna be that much bigger next year. So I'm looking forward to getting back in here again this fall. And I kind of want to tell you guys why I decided this spot in particular. Um, I knew there was a known bedding area up to my north here and there's a food plot that I plant down below as well as some larger uh, agricultural fields that are kind of that destination food source for later on in the evening once the deer funnel their way down and through. I picked this spot by looking at old aerial photography and I actually went back and I looked 10, 15 years ago and I could tell that this area was early successional habitat. What I mean by that, it was wide open. It was pretty much just a wide open grassland area with a couple large oak trees running up this ridge. So I knew that this spot had the potential to be something special when it came to native habitat. As Soon as I got boots on the ground in here, I couldn't believe in every pocket of sunlight underneath of these cedar trees was a native grass stem, uh, a black eyed Susan. Um, everywhere I went, I found signs of native habitat. Underneath the cedar trees, there was absolutely nothing. Um, as you guys know, cedar trees are very, very shady uh, uh, trees. You don't get sunlight to the ground, hardly anything grows. You go underneath of them and it's basically bare dirt and non-desirable species. So immediately I came in here, I the one thing I love about removal of cedar trees is it's pretty simple. You put on a pair of chaps, you grab your chainsaw, and you just start dropping them. Cut them below the lowest limb on the tree, as they won't stump sprout, and that's it. You don't need any herbicide, it's fantastic. Now you could leave the cedar tree uh, in laying in place, and if you come in, do a prescribed burn after a year or two once that tree is dead and, and crispy. Uh, you can remove the trees that way. Here, I actually removed them because I just wanted to get a, the quickest jump start that I could on the spot because I knew that it had so much potential to um, pop up with native species. So that's how I chose the spot, knowing that there was a bedding area, knowing that there was a food source, and knowing that the deer already wanted to travel through here. While I was cutting cedar trees down, there was sign like crazy through here, so I knew it was gonna be a good one. 
Now for the shape, I decided to go with an hourglass-like shape because there's a creek off behind me that bottlenecks the deer down naturally here. And this is basically the toe of the slope off in front of me to my west. The tree that I sat in for that hunt is that cedar tree right there. I left that one on the edge. It gives me ideal cover and it's actually set up for a saddle setup. I, as a private land hunter and a public land hunter, I do love bouncing around and I think that the saddle is also a great opportunity for hunters on private land to bounce to places back and forth where they don't have to carry a hang on. And uh, I utilized that tactic here. I climbed up this cedar tree that morning, cut my branches, got in there. And from now on, I've been hunting in that spot. I do have a bow hook, bow hook up in there uh, just so then that way I can kind of hold my gear um, every single time I come up. And it's just a quick, easy set that I can jump into. Um, so I've burned this thing two times since we removed all of these cedars. And it is amazing the influx of native grasses, forbs. We've got partridge pea. Uh, black-eyed Susans, Indian grass, there's blue stem. I mean, it's just an absolute killer. Right now, fawns, turkey broods, uh, deer running through it. You can see that there's browsing everywhere in it. So, I mean, the deer are utilizing it now. Come fall, however, as those deer are transitioning from bedding to food source, and especially these bucks, these bucks, they don't necessarily like to get out to that food source in the wide open during daylight. Obviously, this is kind of back far enough that these deer will get out of their beds, they'll slowly make their way around, and they'll hit this scrape here that you could see that buck was coming to in this last video that I just showed you. And that's one of the things I took away from this hunt. I'm going to, I'm going to today make this a better mock scrape. Uh, the bucks just beat the crap out of every single branch and they basically just cleared the limb for me. So I'm gonna put a grapevine mock scrape here. I've had fantastic luck with those over the years. And I'm going to go down and I'm gonna prune off every single low hanging branch except for the main scrape branch. Because as you saw in that hunt, that buck, he popped up at about 60 yards and hit another scrape that I knew was there, but I kind of neglected it and thought, well, if he's gonna hit that one, he's gonna hit this one. The problem was that day he hit that one and he turned and went the opposite direction because he was going back to the bedding area that morning. I had to grunt him back and of course, then he decided to swoop down and as you saw, it turned chaotic quickly. But I'm gonna make it so then there's only one scrape for these bucks to hit and it's gonna be right there in front of me. So let's uh, snoop around. We'll, I'll show you a little bit of some of the native species that are in here, show you some of the brows, and then uh, I'm gonna start getting busy on that mock scrape and uh, kind of dive into some more details. All right, so I've got the drill, the saw, and a piece of wire. Now I just have to hunt down a grapevine, which I'm hoping, ideally, there will be one right on the edge of the timber here. So, um, actually I see one right now. It looks like it's like three quarters of an inch, which will be perfect. I've had a lot of luck with grapevines over the last couple years. I've used cedar tree branches, oak branches, basically you dangle anything in front of these bucks in the spot that they wanna be, and they're gonna put their face in it. But uh, the grapevines, they hold up for a very long time, along with the cedar branches and the oaks. But uh, uh, grapevines, they are, they are all over creation here. So I have no problem uh, hunting a couple of them down, but I'm gonna grab this one here. I'm gonna hang it up and I'm gonna get busy on this scrape. All right, so I've got myself my grapevine. This was the scrape that was kind of where I was getting all my trail cam photos last fall. Um, and as you saw, that buck hit a different scrape further on down the line. So. I'm gonna create this one to be kind of the main focal point of the spot, 15 yards from my saddle setup, and I'm gonna cut every single branch on the way down, like I said earlier. Uh, I'm gonna get a good start on it today. Probably not gonna get every single limb down because uh, there's a lot of cedar limbs here, but you get the point, that's kind of what I'm gunning for. But when it comes to these grape vines, you can go with straight ones. I like to get some with kind of some multi-stemmed angles at the end, just to make it that much more natural. And I feel like the bucks like to put the rack in their face in there and kind of whip it around. But what I also like to do is I'll take a drill and I'll punch a hole and wire not only around the stem of this branch to the cedar branch here, but I'll also put the wire through it. So it kind of really tightens it down because I've seen some bucks get violent with these things and uh, end up yanking them out of trees. So um, that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to drill this. I'm going to get it wired up and I'm going to kick the dirt away a little bit. The bucks are going to adopt it because they're already... I can see some footprints in the scrape already, but uh, that's kind of the game plan today. So another tip, I try to get these things to hang about waist high. 
And you remember deer's back is about waist high here, or at least in the Midwest. Um, but I've had it before where you gotta watch out. I've put them in different trees. Cedar trees obviously don't lose their branches, or their branches. Cedar trees don't lose their leaves. So I don't have to worry about this thing going up and down much. But if you're putting it in, say, a walnut tree or, or something that's gonna lose its uh, leaves earlier in the fall, when you're setting it out now, you'll think it's at a good height and it'll drop all of its leaves. And next thing you know, when you come to hunt, that branch will be six feet up in the air. So something to keep in mind while you guys are setting these up, um, I'm gonna get this thing all screwed into the tree. So now that I've got that mock scrape all set up, I'm probably gonna put a stealth camera on it. I'm sure I'm gonna start getting pictures on it pretty soon here. I can tell that the deer are utilizing this like crazy right now. So I'm gonna get a stealth cam on that spot, start monitoring that just for fun. Summertime I know is kind of the time of year a lot of these bucks will end up moving by fall, but it's just fun to see big bucks in velvet. But as you can see behind me here, I've got another key feature to this spot that comes in handy. There was thankfully a white oak tree and a red oak tree a mere 20 yards away from the smallest skinniest point of this pinch that I'm set up in so sets up beautifully for that to now have another food source on the way to the larger food sources that they can hit in daylight in some secluded cover another key feature I think you guys will be able to see is from hunt stands view to the north here I've got another one of these wildlife openings where it was the same thing just choked down with cedar we cleared that and now it kind of creates almost like a wagon wheel effect with multiple different ridges and ditches coming together into one multiple different habitats habitat types habitats that's an interesting new word habitat types all coming together into one area and you'll notice that I'm not necessarily sitting on one in this location I feel like this is the best spot with wind and everything that I can get away with it but it also leaves me more options around the area to kind of bounce around instead of just having one spot. So now I can hunt this spot in multiple different locations, have multiple different entry and exit routes so the deer can't really catch on to my, my moves. So that's another key feature. And I think it's, this is really a project for a lot of you guys that are hunting kind of these monoculture areas that are old growth timber and overgrown pastures to kind of recreate this early successional habitat and areas where you look at a map and you go, gosh, I don't even know where to start to hunt because there's no bottlenecks, there's no edge features. Create your own edge features. Look at the topography, see how the deer are utilizing it already and create it and make it better. Um, you know, all it took was some chainsaw work, wear a pair of chaps, you gotta be safe. Get in here, some blood, some sweat, um, no tears, absolutely no tears because this is all happiness. Getting outside, doing some habitat work, how can you beat that? But get out here, put in some work and you guys will reap the benefits. I mean. You look around and most people just see kind of a grassy area. What I see is fawns running around in the summer and springtime. I see a turkey nest off underneath of a, a small little scrubby area in here and uh, hatching out a brood. Um, we as bow hunters, I feel like it's our job to uh, give back to the resource that we're taking each year. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of people are starting to hop on that trend of habitat work and I think it's very important, you know. You look in a mirror every single day and you don't feel like you're getting any older, but then you look back and you go, wow, I wasn't as fat as I thought I was in high school. Same goes for habitat. You look at it every single year and you don't think it's changing, but it is. The landscape is changing every single day. It's getting older and there's a lot less of the natural uh, causes to create this uh, early successional habitat. So it's a big key. I think it's a big key to bump not only deer numbers, but turkey numbers especially. Um, I know I love turkey hunting in the spring more, more so than deer. I will be entirely honest. I love turkey hunting. So these areas not only come in handy for shooting big bucks out of in the fall, but they will uh, yield a couple broods each spring as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and I hope you guys can find something similar, similar to this on the properties that you hunt. So until next time, guys, bow hunter die, create some good habitat, uh, neglected um, by others. So I just swallowed that. <coughs> <coughs> Oh.